go ahead and call to order this uh, March 18th meeting. It is 18th, isn't it? Yes, sir. Of the Henderson County Board of Education. I'd like to welcome everybody that's here. It's like we got a nice crowd. We appreciate that. Uh, before we move through the agenda, I'd like to remind anybody that's here to address this board for any matter that is not on the agenda. We have time uh, during the meeting that you can do that. However, we'd like for you to fill out a form and give it to Ms. Robin Newton up here, and uh, we'll give you three minutes to address this board uh, somewhere down on the agenda. We have any up here, Robin? Any? Okay. Well, first item on the agenda is that uh, we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Lawson, I know you got a crowd here who's going to help us with that. Yes, sir, we do. I'd like to ask our student ambassadors to come forward and ask everyone to stand with them. Good looking crowd, too. Oh, that's a good crowd. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you. So, Mr. Waller and the board, uh, each of our board meetings, we begin with our pledge and our student ambassadors lead us in that. You all know what a rigorous program it is and what a great job these students do representing our school district. And these are some students who, uh, who have really bright futures who have done a great job here in their high school career. I'm just going to ask them tonight, we'll go left to right, if you don't mind, maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself and what your future plans are. Uh, hello, I'm Ty Boggess. Uh, I'm a senior at Henderson County High School. I'm part of too many clubs, I'm not going to stand up here and name them all. Uh, some of the big ones, uh, city junior ambassadors, student ambassadors, and I'm the class treasurer of the senior class. Uh, after high school, I plan on attending Murray State University and majoring in occupational safety and health with a minor in engineering degree, engineering design. Uh, my name is Gage Beck. I'm a senior at Henderson County High School. I am the class reporter, student ambassador, and a few other clubs that I won't name as well. I plan to go to USI and study accounting with probably a minor in finance or business studies. Thank you, Gage. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Allison Harrison. I am a part of the Henderson County High School cheerleading team. I was on the golf team and the host of state team as well. I plan on attending Henderson Community College and studying marketing. Hi, my name is Aiden Fleck. I'm a senior at Henderson County High School, and I did football all four years of high school, and then I'm a part of Student Ambassadors, and I plan on going to Kentucky Wesleyan and majoring in graphic design. Great job. Hi, my name is Addison Orr. I'm a senior at Henderson County High School, and I have been involved with Student Ambassadors and Coastal State for the past four years. Host to state for the past four years. Um, I plan on going to Murray State University and majoring in nursing. Hi, I'm Brennan Marsh. I'm a varsity cheerleader and tennis player. Um, I'm a senior and I plan to attend the University of Louisville and major in nursing. Hi, I'm Emily Bakhting. Um, I'm in COSA National Honor Society and I plan to attend the University of Louisville to major in biology on the I think you've already had your picture. Have y'all had your picture yeah. already? Yeah. And uh, we know that uh, tonight they're practicing for the senior waltz, me and them are. So, Mr. Waller, any parting words? I just want to tell you, I, I appreciate what you do for our school, our community, and uh, you, we're, we're so proud to have you here and the other folks in the student ambassadors, and you just represent us well. And I know when you go and do whatever you do and whatever club you're involved, that you represent Henderson County extremely well, and we appreciate that. Can't say enough about it. Thank you so much. I just have, to, I just have one thing to say. Have fun at Walt's practice tonight. It's the most wonderful experience as a parent that I had when my kids were in high school. So have fun. Thank you. <laughs> Unless you got two left feet like me. Thank you very much for being here. Next item would be the approval of the agenda. 
we've uh, received that ahead of time. Is there any changes or questions or something needs to be done with the agenda as presented? I move we accept it as presented. I have a motion from Mr. Alvis, second from Mr. McGar. All those in favor of accepting the agenda as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Votes unanimous. Next item would be student and staff recognition. And uh, I'm sub. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't, don't uh, Megan Mortis cannot be here tonight, so I was going to start our um, recognitions, and then Mr. Rush will, will finish it up. On Judges Scholar, we have South Heights Representative Arabella Roper, who cannot be with us this evening, so we would like to um, table our comments until a, fur a future meeting whenever she can join us. That'd be great. So next, congratulations to Thomas Berger for being named a finalist in the National Merit Scholarship Program. The program honors the nation's scholastic champions and encourages the pursuit of academic excellence. Thomas, if you would please come forward so we can recognize you. So, um, Thomas is uh, familiar with coming to these board meetings and being recognized. Uh, he pursues excellence in, in all he does. Uh, you've been recognized here several times. And uh, I have to say, I'm pretty proud that I got to twin with you at the high school on, when you all twin. And I, I see Mr. Payne here, and he twinned with your brother. Uh, they, they took it a, a little bit high, even higher level than I did. You were, you were an all-star even at that, though. And I see you so many things promoting others in school. I'm so glad to see you get recognized. So tell us a little bit about what it means to be recognized as a finalist for the National Merit Scholar Program. Um, being recognized as a National Merit Finalist is a, it's a true honor. I feel like um, it's definitely taken a lot of hard work to get here. Um, I wasn't sure if I would even make it to the semifinals. Um, and I just feel like a lot of it has been a lot of my family. They've always surrounded me with being able to like gain work ethic and gain ways of studying. Um, and they've always been very encouraging with my academic career. Um, and I feel like it's all, it's all, this is just one of the parts of my academic career and I hope that it takes me a lot further. So thank you. Fantastic, we want to award you with a Pursuing Excellence Medal here, Ms. Tracy. Dr. Lawson, I would like to recognize the Henderson County High School FFA. They were named one of the top chapters in the nation. I'm going to read a little bit about this uh, big deal here. The Henderson County FFA was recognized as a national three-star chapter, which is the highest rating a chapter can receive at the 96th National FFA Convention. There are currently about 9,000 chapters in the National FFA organization, and only approximately 3% are awarded this high honor each year. It also ranks Henderson County FFA as one of the top 10 of the chapters, top 10% in the state of Kentucky. This will be the third time, the others were 2014 and 15, the third time for Henderson County High School FFA to receive this award since the chapter, uh, Henderson's chapter in 1954. So, big deal. So, I'd like to, uh, Mr. J.T. Payne and uh, the other FFA members to uh, go see Dr. Lawson. He'd like to interview you.
So um, I think we've got most of you all. Did everybody get a medal? Wow, that looks great. Uh, and those are our Pursuing Excellence medals, and we know that happens within our FFA program. Um, Mr. Rush spoke to the strong standing you have, both in the state and nationally, and FFA is such a fantastic program. And I appreciate the leadership of Mr. Payne and Ms. Lancaster. You've got fantastic examples there. In fact, if, if you all would, I'm going to ask Mr. Payne just to comment on this bunch for a few minutes. Yeah, so we've got a, a really strong officer team this year and last year. Um, we actually, so the process for this ranking is, is they submit an application to the state. Um, and there's about 120 chapters in the state of Kentucky, and each one is required um, in order to retain their status as a, a chapter. You have to submit all the activities and results throughout the year. Um, and then they rank you as bronze, silver, or gold. And once they rank the gold chapters, um, then they rank them in the top 15. And then those 15 get sent to the national level. Um, and from there, they're ranked one, two, or three star chapters. So it's only the top 10%, 10 to 15% of chapters that even get to go to the national level across the nation. Um, and then they, they break them into that. And this is a totally student-led effort. Um, the application, um, Laney was our secretary last year, and the application is about 90 to 100 pages, depending on the year. Um, and, and this is our officer team, and they each take about seven or eight pages a piece. Um, so they've already started working on next year's application. We had about an hour and a half workshop before we came here. So, um, so they're already working on it for next year. And like I said, a, a huge team effort and a lot of effort and, and time goes into the application. So, so very proud of, of this group. I want to echo his sentiments that it, it's a fantastic program. And when he explained it that way, wow, it's really tiered up. To, I mean, that type of achievement is rare. And so we're so proud of your pursuit of excellence. Could I ask you all to kind of scoot in there a little bit? Maybe some of the ladies come to the front and we'll kind of. Mr. Payne needs a medal too. We'll, we'll get Mr. Payne one here. To sort of, we'll get him one too. That's a good idea. Please give him another hand. I was so excited to uh, recognize our 2024 wrestling state champion, Naomi Santiago, but she, uh, she's sick. And so that will give us something to look forward to for uh, next month, Robin. All right. The next person I'd like to recognize is Coach Stephen Hale. Coach Hale was the Kentucky Association of Basketball Coaches Region 2 Girls Basketball Coach of the Year. A few notes before he comes up and uh, talks to you, Dr. Lawson. He had a record of 26 and 8, uh, region champs. He went to the Sweet 16, had a come, behind, come from behind victory against uh, a rival, Owensboro to advance to the Elite Eight. The cool thing, Coach Hale only had one returning starter in that whole team from last year. And uh, amazing of what he did with these young ladies. And um, so another thing to note, um, we beat the state runner-up McCracken County this year and uh, during the regular season. So he's done an amazing job and that just tells you we're not yards, we're, we're not miles from state championships. We're, we're, we're this close. And so uh, 
He did an amazing job in his first year taking over for his Hall of Fame, Father Jeff Hale. Give it up for Coach Stephen Hale. I just want to further say uh, congratulations to Coach, and uh, I'm going to give him just a second to talk. But Coach, uh, all season we were so proud, and we knew that I don't think anybody's ever had a tougher coaching job to take over than you, <laughs> replacing uh, Jeff Hale, uh, the greatest basketball coach we've had. Uh, and you did that so well, and, and that being your dad too, that's just an extra – we all know that that's, that's a great challenge for you. Uh, and I watched a lot of games this year and was – so impressed with your leadership. In fact, though, I, I just got to commend you on the Owensboro game in the state tournament. Mr. Rush mentioned, I think we had one returning starter, but uh, that was Miss Gibson. I think she was hurt. The, so we returned all those kids out there had never played in Rupp Arena. Is that correct? Or been on, like, as far as a starter? That's right. Fantastic. Yeah, so we, a lot of inexperience, a lot of first time out there figuring out that big stage. And we got down pretty good there, 10 or 12 points. We were down 12 points. Uh, and on a stage like that, with all that inexperience and all that pressure on the young kids, uh, I just watched our coach transfer all of that pressure onto himself. And I watched him just continue to stay steady, to, to keep our rotation going, to keep our kids' confidence high. And we just started in that Henderson County pursuit of excellence kind of way, that inspire human greatness kind of way, just to start clawing back and clawing back. And we just kept after them, and it was so neat to see the same fans that were booing us when we come in were leaving the game early when we were beating them at the end. <laughs> and that's because of the pursuit of excellence and the character of your leadership of your team. I just couldn't be more proud. Uh, tell us a little bit about this achievement and your team this year. Yeah, so, so first off, I wanted to say thanks to you know, the administration, the school for giving me the opportunity um, you know, our community, our parents, um, our, our, and then our players, too. <laughs> you know, obviously, you can't get coach of the year if you don't have a good basketball team or if you don't have good support around you. And uh, all that stuff's just really important. Um, it's just a blessing to be able to coach them. And then the state tournament game was, uh, was awesome. The, uh, just being able to coach there was kind of surreal, uh, especially the first game. Second game, the nerves kind of went away a little bit. And I, like you said, I just tried to stay as calm as possible for the kids because I knew we didn't have as, uh, a ton of experience coming back. Uh, if I got shook up in some games this year, our team was also that way. So I had to kind of be the – we don't really, didn't really have necessarily a, a team leader on the floor. I kind of had to be the team leader for the most part. So, you know, going forward, now that we have more experience, hopefully we can get that on the floor some and it doesn't have to just be me. But um, – that was the main thing there at state tournament was just trying to be as calm and collected as possible for the kids because if not, uh, it might have went south. <laughs> Thank you. Next, I would like to uh, congratulate Coach Tyler Smithart. He was the Kentucky Association of Basketball Coaches Region 2 Boys Basketball Coach of the Year. A few notes on him. Record 26 and 7. Regular season, he was undefeated in region play. The season highlight is one of the best wins in Henderson County boys basketball history as we went we went down to face Lyon County they had the number one team in the state they had the number one player in the state and we went to their gym 
and beat them. He lost his dominant player last year in Gerard Thomas, but he didn't flinch. His players bought into the unselfish team concept, and there is no other boys coach in our region who scouts and prepares better than our region coach of the year, Coach Tyler Smithart. Coach, Mr. Rush nailed it there. Go ahead and put your medal on there, man. It looks great on you. There you go. Yeah. Like it, like it looks good on you. Um, your team this year was, it's been one of my most favorite years to watch Colonel basketball because of the way they played for each other. You know, at the end of the season, um, only one team's going to win a state championship, but you have all those games together. You have all those practices together. You have all those bus rides together. And I could tell, too, by your emotional response kind of after the season ended there in the region tournament that you're going to miss this team. And uh, you've just done a, a special job in leadership. Uh, we, we, had, we did have some talent, there's no doubt about that. But the quality wins we had and to make it to the region runner-up and we uh, beat Lyon County during the year uh, speaks well of your leadership. And what you may not know about uh, Mr. Smithart too is he's an exceptional teacher. Uh, teaches AP courses, he's the head of our social studies department. Wore the Colonel jersey. His little boys are out there shooting on the baskets. You got to run them off the floor between the games when they're saying clear the floor and all this stuff. It's always for the Smith Hart kids. <laughs> and kind of trying to get them moving. Uh, but man, he has so much Colonel pride. And I uh, just appreciate the way you pursue excellence both in the classroom, on the court, leading our young men and in the community. So tell us a little bit about your team this year. Well, it, it really is. It's a group that I'm going to miss tremendously. Um, you know, they, they make coaching fun, uh, and they certainly made. Uh, our staff look good. Uh, they are uh, a, a very unselfish bunch. All of them have had to overcome, especially our senior group, have all had to overcome their own individual obstacles to kind of get where we were. Uh, and it made us better. You know, I think those, those challenging moments in life are what really help us all grow to be the people we want to be. And uh, for those seniors to do that and then have the success on the floor uh, was just, it was just a really special season to be a part of. Uh, so I, I, as Coach Hale mentioned, you know, I'm very thankful to be in the position that I'm in. Thank you to our administration and to, to you all and the community for all our support, um, you know, the board and, and all you guys do for us. So, that, I mean, it, it does. It takes everybody. And uh, so it's a, it's a blessing to be in this spot. Uh, it, was a, it was a really fun ride, uh, and I'm glad I got to take it with a great group of seniors. So I appreciate it. <laughs> Dr. Lawson, next on the agenda is the Community Partner Spotlight. You know, I may ask Mr. McGar just quickly, or I don't put you on the spot, Joe. Like, I'm, I'm going to do it, though, just kind of. <laughs> we were at KSBA, and you had a meeting where they were talking about ways to involve the community and the strength of, of partnerships and relationships. Um, you mind telling us a little bit about that and how you had a chance to brag on Henderson County Schools? Yeah, so uh, one of the sessions I attended at, during the KSB conference, uh, the uh, presenter was kind of uh, asking us questions, the class, and one of his questions was, is, uh, what do your boards do to engage the community um, to foster relationships and partnerships? And um, I spoke up, raised my hand, and I said, well, uh, at our monthly board meeting, we have a community partner spotlight where uh, we um, recognize it can be a local business that has done something for the district. It could be first responders. It could be um, any type of organization that has uh, done something for or with or partner with the, the school district and and I just shared that we recognize somebody like that each month and um, I could tell uh, he, he was impressed and I could tell from the reaction of other board members present that a lot of them don't do that and, and it seemed like uh, that everybody took notice of that and, and I, I do believe that um, 
put Henderson County in a, in a good light, at, you know, in front of other uh, school districts and, and board members. So I was happy to be able to share that, and, uh, and uh, my hope is that other board members will go back to their home districts and probably, uh, hopefully, uh, do that as well. So that's basically it. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Mr. McGarb. Um, like you said, we value, out of our core values, we know that genuine relationships are the foundation of everything we do. And from that, we sprung out partnerships. And we've recognized many community partners throughout the past few years. And as kind of our coaches said, we live in a special community where we all kind of pull together in the same direction. And, and like Joe was saying, at, a, at KSBA, we're uh, informally being re uh, recognized there. But today, I'd like to say that we are being formula, formally recognized at, for our partnerships. And I just want to read this to you. We've recognized the library here on a local level before. We know the lots of different partnerships there. But uh, it's, it's really uh, closing the gap in the summertime with the summertime reading we do. Last year, I think it was close to or maybe over 1,000 library cards because uh, of some adjustments that Ms. Wolf and others made to our online registration program and help, help fill those gaps when we're not in school or when students are out there in the evening can be at library programs. But I'll move on with this. The Henderson County Pro, uh, Public Library is the recipient of the KESPRA, Kentucky School Public Relations Association Flag of Learning and Liberty Award. The KESPRA annually honors those who support public education and school public relations with awards. Flag of Learning and Liberty Award, named after the National School Public Relations Association's flag, is given annually to a person, group, or corporation outside of the education field who has made a significant contribution to public education in Kentucky. The award was presented today during the Keysboro Spring Conference in Lexington. Mrs. Mortis nominated the library for this award and there and was there to present it to their team with our honor and so that's why Ms. Mortis couldn't be here tonight but I'd just like to take a second to brag on the board for always valuing and acknowledging community partnerships and this is yet another time that we're being recognized with a state honor for the way we do business in Henderson County Schools and appreciate all those who bring that together and proud of Henderson County Public Library they obviously can't be here because they're receiving the award Thank you, Dr. Lawson. Appreciate that. And if you look down this list of uh, recognitions, we've got a National Merit Finalist. We've got an FFA group that's been recognized on the national level. We've got a couple of coaches that have been recognized on the uh, state level. Uh, we are pursuing excellence in Henderson County. And this part of the meeting, as I've told you in time and time again, is, is one of the, uh, my favorite parts of the meeting so that we can see what our youngsters, what our staff members are all doing to bring and pursue what we call an excellence in Henderson County as well as across the state. And we appreciate what effort, energy, and time that you folks put in to doing this to make our school district and our community proud and uh, as, as uh, one of the best districts in the state of Kentucky and we appreciate that and at this time I'll say that uh, you can stick around for the rest of the meeting or you can feel free to leave well just but, I think Miss Tracy you got oh yeah. did I miss well, something yeah well just just a little something I was trying to decide what I wanted to say about this next person but he kind of described everything that happens in Henderson County is the things that Mr. Waller does for our district. So not only do we have all of these people, coaches of the year, our top FFA chapter, we also have the school, Kentucky School Board Member of the Year sitting in here. Y'all yeah. gotta quit this stuff. This is like three or four in a row, and you're going to surprise me with this. Thank you, Tracy. That, that, that's totally. And we all went to the meeting, so you yeah. can't hide. <laughs> we witnessed it. Okay. That was a public recognition part. Oh, thank you. 
We don't have anybody who wants to address the board, do we? Okay. Anybody forms okay, we'll move past the public participation. We uh, have uh, approval for the minutes of our February 19th regular meeting, as well as some uh, sundry items that were contained in the minutes. Uh, we received those ahead of time, so I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes as presented. So moved. Have a motion, Mr. Alvis. Second. Second from Mr. Smith. All those in favor signify by saying aye, please. Aye. Aye, votes unanimous. Next time you want me about this stuff in hand. Uh, the next item, Dr. Lawson, you're going to give us a report on strategic plan, please. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, every other month, we will be doing the athletic report and rotate that with the strategic plan report. And so, uh, Ms. Robin has up there two of the bullets. You know, we have four columns in our strategic plan. Uh, we're having a lot of success, and we have a great plan that was formed with a lot of different stakeholders. And so, in the students column with this report, uh, it's going to address these two bullets. I'm just going to read these. To increase proficiency in core content areas, career and technical education, industry certifications, and graduation rate. And that aligns also with Build a Better Graduate, where students develop the skills of collaboration, innovation, communication initiative, and critical thinking. So, Ms. Robin, if you would scroll down. We've got just uh, videos you might have seen. I, I kind of wish our FFA team
thank you all for, for watching that. As you can see, when our district says that we're doing our best to provide extraordinary educational opportunities to every student, we're living that mission. So really proud of our people, and thanks to the Mr. Fish and his crew for uh, the high school for putting that video together. Well done. Thank you, sir. Next item would be the school nutrition and physical activities report. Yes, sir. Uh, every year, uh, it's a state law that we must do give you guys, uh, provide you the school nutrition and physical activities report. And so uh, Ms. Robin has given that to you. And then the other part of the law is we have to ask for any public comments if, if there is any. So we've received the report. <clears throat> we've reviewed the report. Are there any questions from the board? For, uh, because we received uh, about 100% and everything we could get. Uh, any questions of Mr. Rush or Dr. Lawson? And if there's anybody here that has questions with regards to that, please speak up. Okay, let the record reflect we reviewed it. Nobody asked questions. Next item would be new business, South Middle School HVAC. Yes, sir. As we discussed at prior board meetings, we have a serious need to update our HVAC systems at South Middle School, North Middle School, and uh, Henderson County High School. And so many of these systems uh, are really outlasting probably their, their expected operational life. Uh, and I give a lot of credit for that happening to Mr. Ben Payne and his team for keeping our current units running well past uh, that intended life, uh, lifetime. Also, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, we know that Billy Ostel and uh, Jack and Cosby, and I know I'm leaving Tony and all kinds of guys for a long period of time have really done a great job. And we've made a lot of things last uh, way past where they probably, those machines and units would have made it without the great work of all these uh, years of those technicians. Um, so as we know, we have to address that need. Uh, because these HVAC projects are very expensive, we will do them in phases. And so we prioritized South Middle School as the project, the first HVAC, HVAC project that we need to do. Uh, one of the reasons we would do that in phases, phases like you said, they're, they're expensive. And so if we do them in phases, it allows us to do that one and also move forward other parts of the facilities plan as we do that. Um, so, in that light, we, um, we, there's a couple different ways that we can go about this process of attaining services for these HVAC um, services. And one way is to uh, do direct purchase through um, agreements, uh, direct purchase agreements. And we've already done a few projects through direct purchase agreements uh, with KEDC and with Omnia, uh, the controls uh, at Niagara, Cairo, A.B. Chandler, among others. Uh, we did those with train, uh, and, that, and we saved money by doing that. It allows us, by doing the direct purchase, essentially that allows us to um, not incur the fees of the architect, which most times are around 6 to 7%. And when you get into these multi-million dollar projects, that number really adds up to a lot of savings. But it's an option for us. Obviously, we can still do a bid process. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about uh, doing the direct purchase route, and we have a company here. Uh, you see in your board packets, there are two companies that put forth proposals, and tonight we have one of those here to present, and I'll talk to you more about those um, in a few minutes. But first, I'd like to ask CTMA to come up and to present to our board on your proposal. Good evening. Um, very glad to be back here. Uh, see some familiar faces. So um, it's uh, always a pleasure to be back in Henderson County. But uh, tonight I have standing with me uh, Mr. Salvador Locke, a good friend and colleague of mine. And uh, we're joined also by uh, Mr. Tim Hawkinsmith, uh, formerly of Nelson County Schools. And for those who may have forgotten, my name is Avery Collier. I've been with you here before. Uh, but 
tonight we have a couple things we'd like to show you. Uh, before, before we do that, though, we just want to express to you that we do consider it an honor to be here with you tonight. We know that this is a really exciting time where you've got a lot of different projects and a lot of options to consider, and so we feel very honored to be uh, a partner that you've used in the past and hopefully again. Um, before we dive into the details of our proposal, we'd first like to share with you the results of a previous project we just recently completed with you, um, and then we'll dive into presenting a, com a compelling case for why we'll make an ideal uh, HVAC partner at South Middle School. Um, so, uh, the address. Yep. so, if you recall about two years ago, I was with you in this room when we were talking about the prospect of doing a solar project. And so the scope of that work was really twofold. One, it was to add solar arrays to eight different facilities across the district, and there's a picture there on the slides. And then obviously those would produce energy, and then you would therefore consume less energy from your electric provider to your utility. It's all well and good. The second bit of that was to uh, essentially whenever you put solar arrays on those facilities, you would then qualify for a more favorable rate structure uh, with Henderson Municipal, your uh, electric provider. So uh, all the remaining energy that you then purchased at those same facilities is now at a much discounted rate. So that's a very good thing as well. Um, the thing to mention there is that we did all eight of these facilities in just a nine-week summer period between the time that the kiddos left and before the time that the teachers return back to their classroom. So we were able to successfully install all eight of those uh, in that time. We were working around uh, this school with the preschool and some summer school activities going on. So we're very proud of that fact um, and considered it you know, a great synergy between our teams and Mr. Haynes uh, to get that work done. Just a couple noteworthy uh, locations is this building. The building that we're uh, currently at tonight has a solar array that we did, as well as South Middle School. Um, and that all that work was completed in the summer of 2000. So that was the recap of what we did, right? But we also wanted to show you how those actually performing. Um, so if you recall, that project actually had a energy guarantee. So for whatever reason, something went awry or they didn't perform the way that we had told you, uh, we would be on the hook of, uh, for that. We're at risk for that. Um, so as a part of that, we wanted to present to you uh, the first year of savings that were just wrapped up in December of last year. So that span, that 12 month span is from January to December of 2023. And I know this is a bit of a colorful chart and there's a lot going on, but the main message I wanted to uh, reveal to you tonight is that we had about 34% additional savings over the top of what we had um, conservatively projected at the time. So we consider that a major success and that they're performing really well. On the right-hand side of this illustration, you can see just one school. I wanted to provide you with an example where this is happening. Uh, so at Henderson County Senior High School, uh, you've got those 12 months of data plotted out. The gray line represents what we had projected at the time of the contract. The green line represents the actual usage that you were, uh, uh, that's being experienced at uh, Anderson County Senior High. And that data is actually coming straight from the solar panels. There's an electrical device that meters that and gives you that in real time. And we've actually set up a really cute like dashboard with a TV that's uh, located in the high school. So you could actually walk uh, over to that uh, dashboard and see that thing that's worth noting is that every single one of those months, the green line representing your actual production is over the gray line. You're producing more. So all eight of those facilities would look that way, and that's uh, represented on the next slide as well. On the left-hand side, we've got all eight of those facilities put together. Again, really just want to say that that's 34% more than what we had projected at the time of the contract. Um, now, what does that mean in terms of dollars? So if you were to take the energy that we had projected and uh, we're was in the guarantee for the contract, that would total up to about $163,000. And that was, again, that was something CUTA was on the hook for. So in the event something didn't perform the way it ought to, we would be writing you a check for the difference. Um, we're proud to present to you tonight that uh, in the actual bills, the first year in that same time frame was $206,000 of annual savings. So uh, about $43,000 over the top. And Henderson County Schools is retained every dollar of that. So we're very proud of that fact. At this point, I'd like to uh, get into the proposal that we have for you tonight uh, for South Middle School. I'll turn the mic over to South. Yeah, appreciate your time tonight. Uh, I want to just briefly remind you of who CMTA is and why maybe you selected us to do that first project. The CMTA is nationally recognized as a leader in energy efficiency. Uh, one key example of that is how we helped the Department of Energy and ASHRAE, our, governor, our governing HVAC, uh, entity ride the advanced energy design book. It is basically a cookbook on how to design an energy savings and energy efficient building 
uh, K through 12 school. And in that book, three of the six examples that they used as examples um, were CMTA designed buildings. So it just speaks to our national recognition uh, on energy efficiency. And in fact, in Kentucky, we're also a market leader here. Uh, you can see by this map the areas and counties that we've done work with. We also do a lot of work with the state of Kentucky, uh, the energy office here. Um, and we've done a lot of projects, not only in Kentucky, but it really in your backyard. Avery's had a chance to work here in your county. I had a chance to uh, lead a project in Owensboro with Owensboro Public Schools in 2020, uh, doing pretty much the exact project that we're doing, gonna propose here in South Middle School there. And this year we're building uh, a project with Davis County as well. So we're very familiar with the contractors in the area. Um, we're very familiar with construction in this area and how things work uh, and how we were able to budget this project uh, for you guys today. Sorry, I'm gonna get a slide. Um, can you go, okay, one slide. Keep going here. Um, you know, we have access to data on how we're able to drive costs down. Um, along the way, we're gonna make sure that we make decisions to, make, to deliver this in the most cost-effective way. Um, we have access to, to data of what traditional and renovations cost throughout the throughout last year in Kentucky. And we can see that our approach, the decisions that we make, make a real impact. And we can see by some examples that I have here how our cost um, for these examples were 33% lower than the uh, other procurement paths that they used. And that's because along the way, we're in the, the engineer of record we know the cost of construction, the implementation that our decisions make. In the end, along the way, we can make decisions such as avoiding sales tax on equipment or um, making sure that we're reusing metal that can last hundreds of years that don't need to be um, demoed um, at the end of the day if you pay attention to the details of during the design process. Um, so this is one way that we feel that we drive value and separate ourselves in the industry. In addition to that, South Middle School has what it's called a water source heat pump school. So this is the HVAC system type that they have there, and we're an expert in this field. Over the past 12 years, we have completed over 55 water source heat pump renovation projects. And as I mentioned earlier, a key aspect of an energy efficient school is water source heat pumps. Um, that's the building block of the most energy efficient design that you can have in a school. And we're also very proud, um, you know, Avery, the projects I did in Owensboro, other projects that we've done across the state, um, we're very proud of being able to hit construction schedules and also to hit budgets that we, you know, come to school districts and promise. Um, we're conservative with our budgets and we're also um, make decisions before construction starts to make sure that we're hitting that first day of school because we know how important that is. And we have examples here of all of our renovations back in 2023 we did over 1.5 million square feet, and all of them um, hit on time uh, for that first day of school. And I've got other examples. And next slide for 2022 and 2021. So all 86 of these were able to, to hit summer construction uh, on time and on budget. Yeah, you can progress to the next slide there as well. Um, included in the schools that Salvador just mentioned is uh, the CTE building. We just watched a video on it walk right out when that was us. We're, there, we're actually currently working on your uh, school at East Heights, so very excited about those projects. Just to continue the conversation about <coughs> results in our local presence in your area, tonight I have for you a list um, of all the top performing Energy Star K-12 schools in the state of Kentucky. And it's not lost on me that this slide is a little bit busy and there's a lot of things your eyes might be drawn towards. I really only have one point to make that's on the next slide. And that is we've done 24 of the 25 schools that have perfect Energy Star school or scores in the state of Kentucky. Um, I think this is you know, indicative that nobody is designing schools as efficiently and as consistently as we are. Nobody's going to be able to have as many. So we're very proud of that fact. You can go to the next slide. So at this point, I think um, you know, we've kind of demonstrated our qualifications, but we still need to do something about the building. So let's talk about the existing conditions, and then I'll pass it back off to Sal, and he'll explain the solutions for those. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, as Mr. Lawson has already uh, explained, South Middle School's in, uh, is the infrastructure there is pretty aged, right? Um, in reality, it's a really good system type. The uh, water source heat pump system you have is actually a very efficient one. 
Um, it's one that, again, we design all the time. However, that's not immune from old age, right? So everything gets older. And as you can tell by these pictures, it's time to retire that equipment. Um, if you've never seen the mechanical spaces before, a lot of the equipment is, as Dr. Lawson had already mentioned, approaching the end of its useful lifetime. So it's time for replacement. And you can actually thumb through like the next two slides. Uh, they look just like this. But really what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, we consider ourselves intimately familiar with South Middle School. Again, we've already done the work here in the summer of 2022. Every square foot of this building I have personally been to. There's not a corner that I haven't visited. Same goes for our team. And so we know the electrical infrastructure. We know the HVAC here at this building. And tonight, the budgetary figures that we provide to you, I think suffice it to say, you can believe that those are rooted in fact and in evidence. It's not just rules of thumb. It's not just throwing your finger up in the air and saying, oh, it's going to be this much or that much. We really have, you know, we consider ourselves deeply acquainted with South Middle School. So I'll pass it off to Sal, and he'll demonstrate uh, or illustrate uh, the solutions for the school. So South Middle School has a water source heat pump system. You can go to that next slide. Um, inherently, what happens is a boiler creates heat uh, for a water loop, and there's a cooling tower that relieves some of that heat. Um, and there's terminal units at each classroom that's a water source heat pump. This water source heat pump um, heats and cools that space, but gets its heat from the boiler in the central plant and gets its cooling from the cooling tower in the central plant. Now, each of these unit ventilators has, um, well, unit ventilators, the water source heat pump, has a, an outside air penetration. And this is needed because in a commercial building, you need to provide outside air um, to ventilate that space. Uh, for the kiddos. What happens and what you currently have going on at South Middle School is that every single one of your classrooms has an outside air penetration and you have to constantly bring in outside air. So that in the winter time, when it's really cold outside, you're constantly bringing in outside air. It's cold outside, you're going to get cold air blown out. Now, when the thermostat senses it's cold enough, it'll kick that heat on and it'll bring in warm air. So in the wintertime, you're kind of fluctuating between hot and cold, hot and cold, and um, you maintain the right temperature, but people sitting next to that unit fit, feel that hot and cold uh, air coming off that unit. Um, and at the same time, in the, in the summertime, you get that same feeling, but it goes from hot, humid air to cold, air-conditioned air. Now, <clears throat> this is more of an issue in the summer. It's not just a comfort complaint. It poses a community concern with your building because you bring in raw, untreated outside air into your space that hasn't been dehumidified to the proper humidity levels or the temperature. So it ages your building with humidity and also creates a, a potential harmful um, environment for mold and, and such. And really, this design hasn't been implemented since the 90s. It's outdated. Um, and as I mentioned, this comfort complaints as well as poses humidity controls in your building. Um, you can go to that next slide. So the first option that we have here today is it's the lowest cost, lowest first cost, but like I said, no one's really done this since the 90s, and there's a reason for that that I went over already. All these penetrations are in your building, and although it is the first, uh, the first option they're presenting is basically replacing everything one for one. So taking what you have out, putting the same thing back, um, and really is using 1990s ideas, um, but doing it. And you can do this, and you're going to get the, the same results. But again, no one's really done this in a long time, and it's something that we wouldn't recommend. What we could do is take option two, which um, still replaces the equipment one for one with the same that you have there. But the difference between option one and option two is that we implement what we call a dedicated outdoor air system. So what we would do is we would come in and close off all of those outside air penetrations, and we would install a centralized fresh air dedicated system. Um, if you go to that next slide, it'll, it'll illustrate it for you. So what happens is you have zero penetrations to the outside. The only single penetration that you have is the one that's linked to the dedicated outdoor air unit. So there's only one path for air to get in and one path for air to get out. And this unit delivers air at the right temperature and at the right humidity levels to each classroom. Um, and by doing so, you can also go to that next slide. Um, you can recover energy that you spent cooling this air down and heating this air down on its way out. 
<coughs> so every in ounce of air that you have to bring into the space, you have to expel out. And with this unit, you have an energy recovery wheel that recovers the energy um, and temperature that you spent uh, conditioning into that air. Um, and so this is a great way to reuse a lot of your existing infrastructure, replace the units one for one, but then do away with the comfort and community issues of that building and install this dedicated outdoor air system um, to make it not only energy efficient, but comfortable and future-proof your building for community problems. Um, and this option um, reuses a lot of the infrastructure that you have and does so in a cost-effective way uh, by making um, energy efficient, making delivering outside air in an energy efficient way. And this is something that we actually did all over Owensburg Public Schools back in 2020. Um, this third option really just leverages the ideas from this option, but takes it to the next level. So as I previously mentioned, you get your heat from your boiler and your cooling from your cooling tower. You're spending utility dollars to make those things run and operate. The third option go removes that boiler, removes that cooling tower, and replaces them with a heat exchanger in the ground in the terms of a geothermal well field. This geothermal well field would draw heat from the ground, would dump heat back into the ground, um, and essentially the only thing that parts that are moving is a centralized pump that moves the water around your building. Um, and instead of paying for the utilities to run that boiler, to run that cooling tower, you're really just moving water through the earth to capture heat and store it and use it at a later time. And at the same time with this option, you would have still the dedicated outdoor air unit, you would have the unit for one for one replacement, and you wouldn't have all those penetrations throughout your building. So these options kind of build on each other, moving from a equipment one for one replacement to an equipment one for one replacement with a centralized outdoor air system to that same design, but installing a geothermal heat exchanger in the ground to make it the most energy efficient possible design. Now, all these options have costs tied to them, and I'm going to go over those now. Um, and <clears throat> a couple of years ago, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed, which has really made a huge impact for uh, districts like you all that are considering renovating your building. It incentivizes counties to implement the most energy efficient system in the forms of the geothermal system by giving you all, for more or less, a rebate the second year that you build it. So you would get um, you know, up to 34% back that second year that you build it, which makes that higher first cost um, a better bang for your buck. And so that this graph that I have here will explain kind of how uh, the life cycle of a 20-year project is impacted by this um, uh, rebate. So the green line highlighting the geothermal option has the highest first cost, but over the years, um, the cost of that system is lower and lower. Um, and I'll highlight those points in, in the next table that I show you. Let me go to that next slide. And you can go one more here. So the net, net capital cost is what I want you to pay attention to here. The three options that I have highlighted there, you can see the cost differences. As I mentioned, the first option, no one's really done that since the 90s. Um, the second option has a lower first cost that when you take into account this, internal, the, this tax credit that now tax-exempt entities like schools have access to, makes the net capital cost of that option three um, the best financial option for the district. And, you know, we're happy to present these options for you guys, and we've highlighted how we approach projects differently. Um, the numbers that you see here today are budget that we put together with, our, with the uh, contractors that we worked with in the area in the past. So I feel confident behind these budgets. Um, I think one key differentiator for CMTA, the way we go to, to market and differentiate yourselves is that we don't have a sales team. We don't have sales training. You can probably tell by how I'm talking to you tonight. <laughs> um, but essentially, we deliver projects and we get new projects by implementing great projects. So we have references on the next slide that you all can reach out to 
done projects, you know, in Davis County, in Owensboro. You can talk to people that's done projects with us in their experience, and all the numbers that you see up here and the contract amounts, they range in values. Um, but one key aspect of all these contract numbers is that um, not a single person that we've worked with has ever received a change order from us. I think I'm something that I'm very proud of is that we'll give you a number, and that's the last number you're going to see. You know, approve our contract, and we're not going to be back here until we present the savings like we do. Um, we're not, you know, one of those companies that nickel and dimes. You're going to get the, the products that you're looking for, and we're going to do so without delivering a single change order along the way. And I'd be happy for you to reach out to any of these contacts uh, within your vicinity here um, in Henderson County. You've heard the proposals. Anybody on the board have any questions of the folks? <coughs> yes, sir. I have several. Okay, we're going from uh, uh, units in each classroom. We're gonna we're gonna close those off so we don't have air straight coming in there. We're gonna go through this uh, heat exchanger recovery system. <coughs> How are you are you going to put new conduits all through the building in order to? Uh, Okay, so you got yeah. So there'll be new ductwork installations okay. ran throughout the building. So, uh, in your controls, are you going to include uh, things like uh, carbon dioxide monitoring in the classroom? You know, I had the benefit uh, of uh, listening to uh, Mr. McIntyre from Warren County uh, talk about green in, uh, green engineering or green design and it was uh, quite interesting at the KSBA meeting and if I can impose on the board's uh, time a little bit <coughs> uh, he talked about carbon dioxide no, uh, monitoring not only to make sure that you had sufficient oxygen levels and I'm saying this in front of you so you can correct me if I'm wrong in my understanding but it also s established a baseline, that's not the word I want to use, but a baseline that says if that room is being used but the, the CO2 level does not uh, rise to a certain level, we're not going to bring in cold air. So it's a money saving or uh, money uh, or uh, money saving aspect to it too. Other thing is uh, another item was ion sampling. Is that going to be included in your system? No, or we're is not. That, is that, you know, is this, is this good things to talk about or is it something that is, see, we, you know, we live, you're well aware we live in the Ohio Valley. Allergy and asthma, mold, pollen, uh, things of that nature. Of course, uh, we're concerned more since we were affected by the virus where air quality has become uh, uh, paramount. Uh, is that part of your system, or or is that uh, an add-on, or is it a is it a uh, something that is practically attainable? Let me put it that way. They are practically attainable, and uh, you have a very thorough understanding of that CO2 monitoring system that McIntyre was referring to. He had basically dampers at each classroom that turned that unit that basically closed air access to that building to that classroom that CO2 level was satisfied. That is a way to save energy because you're able to slow your fan down because you have less demand of air. Um, the way we're designing and the way that we're proposing to in South Middle School, we don't have that included, but it could be included. It's just you would need another piece of equipment in, in, the, in the ceiling in terms of that damper uh, and another sensor in your space that can in be looked classroom. into. What's that? In each classroom? Each classroom would need a sensor, and each classroom would need a VAD box. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to uh, uh, the, the other thing I want to bring up is in uh, South Middle School, we have an auditorium that has a very high ceiling. Mm -hmm. It's a very large volume. We have a uh, gymnasium that is quite uh, large. Um, possibly. Uh, can't remember being in the cafeteria, the details of it, but in a conversation with another board member, that's a possible uh, concern there. Uh, we have used uh, high volume 
low speed bands in these areas in our gymnasium. Mr. McIntyre uh, uh, said that uh, Warren County used, and that's just a, made, uh, a standard design feature in their building uh, approach. And I've read things like uh, uh, these bands making a uh, seven degree, four to seven degree, and some, uh, I think Mr. McIntyre and his team don't hold me to that, said a 12 degree. That is a significant difference because you are turning that air over. I'm trying to talk to the, then you too. That's those big fans, right? Mm -hmm. They got those special guys, names for them. Go going. down to hometown <laughs> roots and, and look at their fans. Big fans. Yeah. But the thing about it is, is they, they move a lot of air, but they don't move it so much that you feel like you're being blown away. Now, uh, and, it, and it reduces or eliminates stratification. Am I on the right path? Okay. Seems to me, uh, if I can uh, uh, indulge you a little bit, seems to me if we're going to spend this kind of money, we need to do it in a comprehensive way. That is an item that we have done, and actually all of the, the gyms in Owensboro, when I did that project in 2020, they all got those fans. And the reason those fans get installed from an energy sta saving standpoint, I'm not going to sit here and preach saying that they're going to save you a ton of money, but from a comfort standpoint, they make a difference. You're right. It well. evens the temperature throughout that entire gymnasium to where all the car occupants are seeing that similar temperature as opposed to sitting up in the high bleachers and in the wintertime roasting because the heat rises, as we all know. Well, but the, you know, it, okay, you can, you can start splitting hairs, uh, uh, you know, fly specks and pepper as far as you know, what's comfort and what's cost. But uh, it, it seems to me, especially in that auditorium, that's just a screaming example of, of where you want to uh, address stratification as best you can. My understanding is these stands don't really cost that much. But that wasn't part of your proposal, right? No. Okay, so if that's we want to deal with that, up. then that's something we're going to have to kind of give uh, Bob or Mr. Chad Thompson or Ben some direction to go on that. If, there, if that becomes an issue, but that's not part of this proposal, correct? That's correct, but that's also an item that can be easily designed and bid, and when the bids come back, we can see if that's included, if that can be included in this project or not. Okay. Yeah, I think it's important just to know if, if there's any certain features that you all want to see, we've done it before, and more than likely we wrote the bid book on it, so if there's something you'd like to well, see included. It's, it's not yeah, a question of want to see, it's a question of what makes sense and, and what, what is cost effective in, in accomplishing this thing in, in, a, in a comprehensive nature. One last question, if I may. Uh, this grant, uh, 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 based on the inflation reduction uh, things, is this a thing we apply for and maybe gonna get and it sounds great or uh, how, how, how locked in is that? And then the second part of that question is, what, what are the requirements to comply with that after the fact? So it's a new thing, and it's new to schools. So schools don't typically do their taxes just because they're a tax exempt entity. So it's a new process that the federal government came up with, but that money was created and is there um, for people to use. It's not something that you're waiting on the federal government passed this thing, and checks are starting to roll out in the next month for the first applicant for this kind of money. But it's an application process. It's not really an application process. It's more of a put your paperwork, paperwork in once you've did the project, and you'll get the money. It's not a you may get these funds. It's the funds are there, build your project, file your taxes that you've never really done before, but we'll walk you through that in the consultation through that and get you in, in contact with the right people to make it as easy as possible. Um, and you file your paperwork and, and you're, you'll get a check. And in fact, I know Jason, my, my partner, has helped somebody file that, that paperwork over a Teams call and they're you know waiting their check now. Yeah, in other words, it's not competitive. It's not something you have to compete with other schools. Well, okay, we won't get into the weeds on that one. I 
dollars to the federal government for 30 years. So. Good questions, Mr. Alvis. What about the equipment? How is the, the equipment, uh, what, what kind of equipment and that, that once you get into the design phase? It's really up to you all. Um, we're willing to work with whatever equipment preferences you guys have, and we have access to all the, the major players. Um, we worked with Train before. We worked with whatever equipment vendor that you want to use. Um, we're able to have access to competitive pricing from them. Um, and in fact, our procurement path allows us to also purchase that equipment without sales tax, um, which is one way that we're able to reduce costs. If I may, uh, I thought that the uh, we we've made it a policy and for good reason uh, to uh, standardize on train systems. I thought train so too. Systems. I, I, I thought so. That's why I'm asking about that's, the equipment. That's, and that's are you, are, do you have direct purchasing with train? We do. At through the same um, pricing methodology that you all get, we have access to that. Um, okay. Same that's competitive good. pricing. Any other questions? Well, wait a minute. Back up a couple of these, these slides, then, uh, Robin. I, I thought I saw a price up here already. That's a budgetary number for, for where we're at now. That's, and that we're, we feel pretty good about that number, but the project's not been designed yet. Does that, that y'all understand? That it's, it, it is a budgetary number, but that number we, we do this every day. We just did this in Davis County. We gave them okay. Well, so if budget. we were to say, yeah, we want to go with you, if that's Dr. Lawson recommendation that we want to go with this then we would anticipate you doing with what you've explained to us and maybe not the ionos sure. maybe not the big fans <laughs> maybe not some other things that we've talked about that may be something we want but if we were to say that if we want option three that you would come in at that price with no change orders or below is that what we understand? So we would define the scope of work. The project option they were presenting with you today, that budget was created with the contractors that would to be doing the work. So we reached out to them and said, this is the concept of the design that we're putting together. Give me a price of what you think you're going to charge me for this. We did this across all trades and got a budget pulled together to start somewhere with deciding what project to go after. And including the equipment. Including the equipment. We got direct quotes from train, in fact, okay. uh, on the equipment. At this point, we would desi start design, which means calculating the heating loads, the cooling loads, the size of ductwork that we need, where the ductwork's going to go exactly, lay it all out on a set of plans. And those contractors would then do manual takeoffs and material takeoffs, detailed counts of things that they would need to be purchasing, and they would, they would give us a firm price. Uh, on what that's going to cost. And it would come in at that cost that you have budgeted right there or lower yes. with no changes. On that, yes. Yes. So, yeah. so we, when we did the solar project, um, you know, eight different schools, there's a lot of different things you're going to encounter. That price that we all agreed to that night, uh, I never once approached you back here and said, hey, guys, we need more money. 
not it's talking about solar system. project, I'm not talking about talking about this project, yeah, which is well, altogether it's different. The same methodology, right? So the same concept applies here. If it's the option three, we come to you and say, okay, you know, these are our budgetary figures. We go and we go to design. We'll have a new number. We'll be within 10% of that number here, so you can see it's not. Ultimately, though, if something goes wrong, let's say we didn't do our homework right, or let's say something that we couldn't see underneath the infrastructure of the building is not the way that we thought it was at the time of the design, we are not going to approach you and say, you know, open hands and say, we need more money to complete that scope of work. We are at risk for that the whole long way. Okay. Anybody have any other questions? Sounds pretty good. In fact, what you said that, so this is test of strength. Is that what you said earlier? You said that. So I know you said you have multiple. We have access to multiple. And, you know, the way I like to do things is I competitively bid everything to hold people responsible to that price, I guess, so they don't, if I'm going to tell you I'm going to buy your stuff, you know, you may give me a, you may be able to charge me extra. I'm not saying that they're going to do that, but that's just something I like to do, and um, at the end of the day, it's up to you guys who you select, no matter what price they send to us. Do we have to wait until the project's completely finished to fill out the application for that ITC incentive? Yeah. Because we know how the federal government gives out money, and then all of a sudden you get ready to spend this in, and they're like, oh gosh, guys, sorry, we already gave out all the money, so we don't have any more. I understand your frustrations with that, but. Well, we just, you know, we deal with the state of Kentucky all the time, <laughs> you know, so it's the federal government, you know, three million dollars is a lot of money to lose just because there wasn't, it wasn't there when we filled out our application. Well, I, I guess it leads me to another question. And Ben and I guess Donnie and Dr. Lawson, y'all have said we want train. And train controls, train equipment. Now, do you all have the catalog or how do you get this? Do you, I mean, you go to the train manufacturer and say, what would all this equipment cost us? And this is the price we're going to get? The train rep, yeah, we spell out the number of units that we need. The type You've of done units. this in this budget proposal is what you're yeah, telling me. Yeah, yeah, There's exact train equipment is who we got that budget number for. It's, you know, a component of all, all the different costs that go into doing our full renovation. Is the, you got equipment, electrical, mechanical, controls, structural, roofing, all of that, and equipment was one of them. Excuse me. Project like this, or at least if you have a uh, you have a design uh, computer program that you run all your your uh, uh, conduits and things like that, and your uh, equipment, and that generates a bill of materials. Is that correct? And then all of these uh, all of these manufacturers already have a compatible catalog with that program. I can't remember the name of it when I was working for the Navy, but that was the de facto program. And you could design a whole daggone thing, and it was just, you were pulling items off uh, that met those requirements based on that bill of materials. Is it still pretty much that way? Yes, yeah, so the AutoCAD pro program AutoCAD, probably that you're right. referring to. Yeah. We spell out the size of the units that we want. We'll base it around train, and then other competitors can bid against that, but we're gonna keep it with train here. Um, Get a price from train, you put your train equipment in. Any other questions? Comments? Dr. Lawson, do you have a recommendation that you want to present to this board with regards to this project? If you don't mind, I'm going to ask these, I'm going to ask these guys to sit down for a second. We, we do have uh, two proposals here tonight, and it's an awful lot of information, and it's an awfully big decision. And so I want to make sure that we're all doing our due diligence. I think your questions and input is very, very good. Um, ben Payne is, uh, <clears throat> Ben and Donnie lead our maintenance department, and Ben leads more of the mechanical side of our maintenance department. And so he met with CMTA and Train, uh, the other company who provided a proposal for you uh, for the board meeting tonight. Um, 
the train representative could not be here tonight to represent uh, train and go through their proposal as CMTA did. But if you don't mind, I'd like to uh, bring Ben, who is really our resident expert here at Henderson County Schools up uh, and just have him explain a little bit of the, um, about train's proposal, the similarities between the proposals. Um, and the, one of the reasons I'm doing this is because it's been uh, the highest priority of this board to have train equipment and so that we could standardize across the district so we could build the last so to speak that gives our technicians the best chance the working knowledge of the same type of equipment and that we have also had a uh, good um, good fortune with train products and so to move our district not just in the next you know 10 or 20 years that we're really building the last in the district and I know that's always Ben's intent uh, so Ben, would you mind telling us, uh, so with the, tr tell, walk us through, if you don't mind, what you've done with both companies. If you don't mind, do that first, and then tell us, do, in, do you see any discrepancies in the train proposal and the CMTA proposal? Sure. Good evening, thank you all. So we started this uh, process about six, eight months ago. We charged both companies with the same task of here's where we are, here's where we need to be with the R22 uh, refrigerant issues in the age of the equipment just kind of pushed this, like I said, we prioritized our district needs as we needed, and then we started to focus on pinpointing on what we could do to start checking boxes and getting our district ahead of, this, uh, ahead of the game right now. So we took each individual companies through our building, scouring all our buildings top to bottom, finding needs. Uh, like for like, we gave three different metrics on what we kind of wanted. We wanted a, a good, a best, and a better, basically, what we were wanting to do to get the best bang and always keeping the district money in, uh, in mind. Also, for the tech technician side and maintenance side of the district, we also wanted to keep a standardization with the train, the support, the equipment that we know, the, all the attributes of these pieces of equipment, we know the good, the bad, and the ugly, so our technicians are well educated on how to work on these things uh, as quickly, possibly, and as efficient as we can. So we started, like they said, they alluded to, uh, we started in the basement, and there was no stone unturned, went all the way to the roof, both batted around a lot of good ideas that uh, how to make this like for like, like with DOAS, and then GEO with DOAS on how we could get move the needle into the next future, getting ahead of the game with efficiencies, the money, and all that stuff. So all that being said, both companies were charged with the same task, and I feel like looking at the proposals that I've received, both companies fully understood the assignment and where the board stood at and how we could move this, the needle forward going in the future and getting this utilized. So with the two, so both companies, you've been with them, you've explained what we, what the intangibles are for us, what the priorities are for us. They both had the same opportunity to go to South Middle School, view the building, um, and then they make their proposal. Is that correct? I have been absolutely transparent to a fault for both companies. Yes, that's correct. Well, you always are, Ben. Thank you for that. Now, so the train proposal has the train equipment and then I'm a little I'm a little confused on the CMTA is that for sure that we have the train equipment so that's equal so I guess is what I'm trying to say here that that's a that's a priority for the district it's an intangible that has to be required and they have to be without getting into product numbers and model numbers and all that stuff those have to be equal in terms of that proposal Ben do you see these in this proposal as the equipment is the same, exactly the same, from one proposal to the other. To the best of my knowledge, without seeing model numbers and serial numbers, uh, I think that both companies could say that I've been very vocal about what I want and what the district needs going forward as far as, I haven't seen model numbers, serial numbers to compare side by side, but they both got their pricing and, and model numbers from the same company. Okay. To the best of my knowledge. Yeah, thank you for that. Then are, so in the train proposal, we've heard the CMA proposal, the board has read both the train proposal and the CMTA proposal. 
Um, do you, as the guy who uh, is going to do the day-to-day -day work, you and your team, see those? Uh, are those proposals, uh, are they similar? Are they kind of alike, or are they more, uh, almost exactly equal? See, it looks pretty equal, in my opinion, from looking at these two proposals. Essentially yes, the same proposal? the same. Yes, sir. Okay. Systems are the same, uh, you know, there's just a little bit minor details. Okay. Is there anything else from the board that, um, Mr. Albert? I'd like to, I, it may take a little bit longer, but I think it, in the end we'll have a better product. I'd like to say, figuratively, if not actually, let's table this thing, go back to the, to the, propo uh, the two uh, entities and say, look, give us, give us something that has these other features in here if, if that is the will of the board. I mean, I did a lot of talking, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody in this room really wants all that. Okay. Or come back to us with another, or maybe they, don't, they haven't made up their minds on that and we need to have a second proposal that says, you can do this, or you can do that. Uh, you know, I don't want to drag it out too much, but there are, you know, this fellow McIntyre in Warren County was, uh, he gave a very comprehensive uh, thing, and uh, everything that he came up with, he talked about in detail, and it was solid stuff. And you'll just have to take my word for it, whether sure. you, you know, but, uh, you know, things like the CO2 monitoring and the ion uh, monitoring and things like that, uh, th those were all things that it wasn't just gee whiz, it was something I thought, you know, this, this fellow knows what he's talking about. He's the chief financial officer, so he doesn't just go out there and buy goodies off the shelf because it appeals to his technical sense of wonderfulness. He's going out there and, and getting stuff that he can see that there is a return on investment that is that, that makes sense for the district. Are you, you with me so far? Yes, sir. Yeah, I am. Okay, so that being the possible case, then that's why I was asking the young man, is this, uh, is this uh, Goldilocks and, uh, and uh, and, 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 and technical frou-frou, or is it hard stuff that uh, has, a, has a real value? I think that some of this stuff has real value, okay? So I would like to, I would like to go take a little extra time, go back and say, okay, what about these items here, and uh, put them in there. And then there's one last thing. Anytime you get more sophisticated in your controls, you also have more vulnerability as far as, uh, as uh, cyber uh, considerations. Do you mind if I respond? Sure. Yes, sir. You bring up a lot of great points. Um, what McIntyre, the Warren County CFO, and the the person you keep referring to, the engineer of record is CMTA, and that's who he's been working with to deliver yeah, these I, I uh, all, all these actions. And the ideas that you brought up as far as the CO2 sensors, the VAV boxes, the ionizations, the fans, all four of those components can easily be designed as alternates in the decision that you're making today. So just by making a decision on the company that you're going with today, you're not kissing those ideas goodbye. You still have access to those ideas, and although that's not considered in the pricing today, those are very easable, easily designed items that at a later board me meeting when you're approving the contract, we would have the opportunity, if we're lucky enough, to work with Ben and the team to say, this is what this idea costs, this idea costs, do you want to include them, take it to your board, here are the pros and cons of each, and we would come back with you with. Um, alternate pricing to add on those four things that you mentioned. Well, I still think that I, I understand, I think I understand what you're saying. And, uh, you know, here's, here's your phase three, that's the main things and all that. And 
then for this additional amount of money, we can do this, and for that additional amount of money, we can do that, and all that. Some of those things, as I understand it, have to be integrated into your system when it's first built. Correct, and that's why you would decide once you sign a contract. Right now, you're not decide, deciding, um, right now you're deciding which company you're gonna have design and build this thing. At a later date, you have the opportunity to add those options in before construction starts. Okay. The fans you can, you can add after, afterwards. Well, we would begin design right now if you are just like a company and then before construction next summer of 2025, you have plenty of time to decide whether you're gonna include those fans, for example, or not between, you know, you know, you would probably have to order those fans March of 2025. So you have plenty, sorry, 2024. Yeah, 2025, I'm sorry, um, to decide whether or not you're gonna implement those fans or not. So you have plenty of time to decide that. Okay, option. well, we gotta go through some sort of a formal process for procurement uh, to meet the proprieties of, of uh, procurement. So uh, there's where I, we need to, I, somebody else has to get involved. No, sir. No, I think you you've got legitimate questions that uh, would apply to both groups that have proposed this. So, again, I don't know what the flavor is of what you've got, Dr. Lawson, but uh, you can see that there's several questions with regards to where we're going. Maybe we should have a, another meeting, another workshop with both groups that have been proposal and go from there. I don't know. I would suggest that. I think I think we'll come up. I think we'll come up with a better product. I think here's my observation is that both of these proposals, except for the way you start out, you have an engineering group that is on the front end of one of them. You have an in-house engineering group, but at certain level they're both the same. Okay, but not, neither of those has has CO2 ion or fans. Wait a minute, CMTA has, has entered the, the application for the uh, government funding. Uh, you know, certainly a, a legitimate aspect. That's one of the, the, the significant differences. Am I off? Am I, I think off both companies far? have uh, the CO2 monitoring. Huh? I think both companies have the CO2 monitoring. Was, I, didn't sure. see it in, I didn't see it in the, I didn't see it in the discussion. I could have easily sure. have missed it. I, I think we're done, I think we're, we're past proposals and discussions. I, I think we're at, with us right now, all right? And, and I, I, I don't think you're mucking anything, Mr. Alice. I think that uh, uh, we probably weren't as involved in this as what we could have been and maybe should have been, all right? At no fault of anybody else's as we got moving through this. And uh, I think it's gonna take some little more discussion. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's wisdom, I don't know if my mic's, I think there's wisdom in what Mr. Alvis and Mr. Absolutely. Waller are saying. And as Ms. Tracy says, still questions remain. And this is at minimum, you know, if we, uh, it, it seems to me that the best investment for Henderson County Schools is likely going to be something possibly geothermal. So that's gonna raise this investment up to probably close to a $10 million investment. So uh, we want to take our time and get that right. Yeah, and uh, if there are additions we can make later, uh, separate from this, then obviously we want to explore that. We've protected um, these two uh, proposals, and so we can come back to that if it's okay with the board. I'd, tonight, uh, the, the, we have the option to take action, but after hearing from Mr. Alvis and the rest of the board, I think there's wisdom in uh, taking our time. We know that there's been a lot of work done through the years to make these machines last and they can. Uh, I also want to say a big, uh, just to recognize, um, uh, it sounds easy, like uh, when I say what Ben has done, but it's not. And we're so fortunate that Ben has been so involved in this process that Ben Payne has been the guy really to make all this happen. So Ben, I don't want anything to discount your work here. I appreciate all that you've done and your knowledge here. But at this time, uh, my recommendation would be that we spend, we do not take action on this item tonight and that we spend some time studying these proposals. Got that. You heard the superintendent's recommendation. I have a motion that we table this item until. I'll make that motion. 
I have a motion from Ms. Second. Williams, second from Mr. Alvis. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Votes unanimous. We'll table it and deal with it as we give you more information and as you give us more information. But we do want to make this happen pretty quick. Absolutely. And thank you to CMTA for coming tonight and presenting. Yes. And uh, thank you. Next item would be the uh, I-69 waiver approval. Uh, Beth, anything you want to say I, I other than we've got really we've got to add and it's not nearly as exciting as a uh, geothermal unit <laughs> um, we submitted exactly what we presented to the um, to KDE the last time for our um, pro for the I-69 property acquisition last time they simply allowed us to utilize the um, the evaluation that was done by the state this time they wanted us to submit language saying that we were requesting a waiver of doing our own appraisal of the property and accepting it so they need that magic language so that it can go to the state board for approval so not sure what the difference is this time and last time except maybe a different person looking at the paper we've seen the waivers anybody want to read it out loud <laughs> it's just <laughs> Or I'll entertain a motion that we uh, go ahead and accept the waiver as best written it for us and uh, sign it and send it on. I have a motion, Mr. Alvis. Second. Second, Ms. Williams. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. aye votes unanimous. We'll go ahead and deal with the waiver then Excellent. with their language. Thank you. Next item would be the consent agenda. We have uh, nine items on the consent agenda, which uh, includes transportation requests, school activity fundraisers, student overnight trip requests, shortened school days for a couple of students, the technology plan for 24-25, contract approval with AT&T for various agreements with our bus Wi-Fi, bid recommendations, and grant applications, and uh, some surplus items. Is there anything within the consent agenda that would need to be pulled for discussion, please? Not pulled, but Donnie, are, do you have a tentative date for your surplus auction? Okay. Okay. Would you, you want to buy? just email me with that date of when it begins? Thanks. Okay. So. Any other comments or questions with regards to the consent agenda? If not, I'd entertain a motion that we approve the consent agenda as presented. I have a move, motion from Mr. Alvis, a second from Ms. Williams. All those in favor signify by saying aye, please. Aye. Aye, votes unanimous. Next item would be financial. Okay, the Ms. Treasurer's, Treasurer's report for the month of February includes total receipts of $6,357,019 total expenses of $5,841,027 for a net increase in all funds of $515,992. Any questions on that? Anybody have questions, Ms. Cotier, with regards to the Treasurer's report for this month? Dr. Lawson? There are no questions. I'd request the Board approve the Treasurer's report as presented by Ms. Cloutier. I've heard the Superintendent's so recommendation. I have a motion, Mr. Alvis. Second, Mr. McGar. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Votes unanimous. Next would be the paid warrant. Okay, paid warrants cover the period of February 20th through March 18th and include total paid warrants of $2,929,982.33. Any questions on the paid warrants? Any questions on any of the bills that are presented? Dr. Lawson? If there are no questions, I'd request the board approve the paid warrant report as presented by Ms. Clotier. Heard the superintendent's recommendation. I have a motion, Mr. Alvis. Second for Mr. McGar. All those in favor signify by saying aye, please. Aye. aye. aye votes unanimous. Robin, would you please let the record reflect that we've received the personnel actions since the last board meeting and have been reviewed by this board. Next item would be an executive session pursuant to KRS 61.8101K and KRS. 156.5576C, formative discussions on the superintendent's evaluation, as well as anything else I need to add to those K's and L's and B's and F's? I don't think so. 
So I'll entertain a motion to go in executive session. So moved. Have a motion, Mr. Alvis. Second. Second, Ms. Williams. All those in favor signify by saying aye, please. Aye. aye. I vote unanimous. There will be no action taken after this uh, meeting other than to adjourn. So anybody that uh, feels like they want to stick around for anything, you can. But I wouldn't if I were y'all. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. I appreciate that. <laughs>